Thank you very much. We're nearly there, people. Um, I can take this off. We're nearly there. Thank you so much for staying on to the bitter end. Um, you will also be pleased to learn that I will be keeping this good and short. That's partly because Andre and Nikita have both said that they, to an extent, were repeating each other's material. And guess what? They've used all of mine as well. So uh, I think what we will do is uh, I, I will give you the English perspective um, and I will hang my talk around uh, a format of, first of all, comparing court and arbitration. We've already done that. Enforcement. I will add some further comments on the 1958 uh, Convention, the New York Convention, and I'm obliged to learn that we're now up to 160. Uh, I also have 159 down on my list. Um, uh, and then we will, so essentially you can see that we have covered from a Russian perspective quite a lot of this material already. So I will try and find uh, different things to say. Uh, from the English perspective, we are very fortunate that despite our best efforts, our recent bout of national insanity with Brexit uh, and, and the way that that slightly undermines our credibility internationally, we do remain a global centre for dispute resolution. And the reasons I think that is there is that partly we got there first. Uh, international dispute resolution has overwhelmingly grown out of the insurance industry. Uh, and that started with the uh, Lloyd's insurance market more than 300 years ago. And what this meant, that it was worthwhile, those underwriters, over decades and then centuries, to come up with known decisions on how those policies should be interpreted. And in England, we operate the system of common law, that is, judge-made law. So what you therefore do is to, through the common law process, build up a library of case law, which means that uh, anybody can go and work out how a particular point should be decided, which hopefully will stop them having a dispute in the first place, because everybody knows what the result should be. And so that process has been going on for over 300 years. And as I say, it, has, it is very much a creation of the insurance industry, and in particular the marine industry, marine insurance industry in the UK. And that has gradually spread out. So we have in England a great uh, history. And my job in the current generation is to see that with all this competition, we've seen competition between uh, MAC and we've seen for uh, Andre's uh, organisation. Yeah. So I, I'm trying not to, so that we won't make it a sort of a beauty contest, uh, but I will tell you a little bit about the English system. And a second reason that uh, we have uh, a large, a, it's still the dominant force in marine dispute resolution, insurance dispute resolution, in England, and is that because we have this long tradition of case law being developed, it also meant that we, we developed <laughs> the specialist judges uh, to hear those disputes, and with that, uh, more recently, specialist arbitrators uh, for those that prefer the arbitration process. So, for example, if you have an insurance dispute in London, which is uh, governed by English law and subject to high court jurisdiction, we have a designated commercial court. And every single member of that court, every single judge, has come up through the ranks of being a barrister specialising in insurance, shipping, trade, energy. All the key things that the people in this room are interested in. And so they have gone through that system and eventually they become judges. And we are fortunate to have a really good body of professional judges who will be able to determine your dispute if you go down the High Court route. 
and that's also we as we have this split system in England. So uh, I, I'm I actually qualified as a barrister, but I've always practiced as a solicitor. So we have, uh, like Leonid, I'm a member of a global law firm, but my pitches in relation to the English law aspect of, of that global firm. And so we have these uh, large law firms in London who will then uh, gather in, prepare the cases, and if it should go to court, we have go to specialist barristers to present the evidence, and the judges, again, are specialists. So we have in England a, uh, a legal infrastructure which allows us to deal with these uh, disputes. Um, in terms of arbitration, which has come along more recently but has still got a long tradition in England, uh, we have built up um, a number of arbitration bodies, which I will briefly mention in the course of, of this short talk. Um, in terms of the maritime sector, we have the London Maritime Arbitration Asso Arbitration Association, uh, 70 odd years old, a large number of uh, arbitrators and they are drawn from the legal profession but a lot of them deliberately are commercial people so that uh, if you, you, you can bring a greater commerciality or a technical background, um, naval architects and the like, so that your dispute can be resolved by people uh, that are going to have a feeling for and an understanding of the uh, requirements that you have. So, as I say, I'm using this as a sort of, uh, to hang the talk around. If we start with court fee uh, arbitration, um, in England, until recently, it was, uh, it was very tempting if you had the choice to go for arbitration or high court. I actually used to push people, particularly in the insurance industry, towards the High Court uh, because you were getting this very professional body of judges uh, paid for by the English taxpayer. So it was very cheap uh, to issue your claim forms and the whole legal process uh, was then paid for um, by the taxpayer and you didn't have to pay any fees. I think uh, in these straightened times that we all live in, the British government thought we ought to have some more money out of it. So now if you issue in the High Court in London, uh, you actually have to pay 5% of the claim up to capped at £10,000. So if you've got a claim of £200,000, uh, you will have to pay a court issue fee uh, of £10,000, which is quite a lot of money for a £200,000 claim. However, that's all you pay, and if, as you go through the rest of the dispute resolution process before those judges it is essentially free. That, of course, as has been mentioned by the other speakers, contrasts with arbitration, uh, where some, uh, some arbitrators do know how to charge, and they're charging on an hourly basis. So uh, it, it, often arbitration, which is thought of uh, often as a a more slimline procedure can actually be uh, quite a lot more expensive than the High Court. But again, for all the reasons that um, we were, uh, we've, we've heard already, such as confidentiality, uh, the appeal to have an arbitrator that uh, may have a particular technical or language skill, uh, uh, means that in certain cases it's the more natural choice will be arbitration. Um, and again, if you, the arbitration bodies to make themselves attractive uh, offer various schemes uh, for low cost for small claims. You have the LMAA small claims procedure, for example. So again, it's, you, it, when you're deciding which way to go, you can ju just adopt a, a sort of horses for courses basis. Um, and again, it's touched on by previous speakers. Uh, in most jurisdictions, including in England, uh, there are very limited appeals from arbitration. So that may suit the parties if they thought, we've got this commercial dispute, we need it resolved, we don't want it to, to go on through layer after layer of... Uh, and so if you go for arbitration, uh, 
the arbitration, the final arbitration award really should be final and there is very limited scope for appeals. So it's really your choice uh, which way you go. Um, process wise, these days, frankly speaking, there isn't a great deal to choose between uh, High Court in England and uh, arbitration. Increasingly, arbitration, which may have started out as a, as I say, a more slimline procedure, has essentially adopted more and more of the features of High Court. So you will have the IBA rules about the gathering of evidence. Um, if you don't, the court obviously has greater powers of compulsion, but in England, the High Court remains the supervisory body for arbitration. So if something goes wrong, you need to use extra powers of the court. Um, <laughs> we've had, I think, all three speakers so far have mentioned the New York uh, Convention, which is one of the big advantages of, um, of arbitration. I'll take a different approach on this, in that um, in England, uh, if you get a, a high court judgment and you, for example, uh, wish to enforce it in Russia, good luck. Uh, you might get it enforced, but there are many procedural roadblocks and you would be very much in the hands of the judge who decides it whether he is going to, or she, applies the rules of judicial comity to say, yeah, we really ought to uh, give effect to a foreign judgment, it all looks all right, we should do this. Well, it doesn't necessarily happen. Uh, and so it's actually quite tempting if you are a Russian body that doesn't want to have uh, um, judgments enforced against you to choose English law and high court jurisdiction because someone can go to all the trouble of, uh, uh, of getting a, a, uh, an expensive high court judgment against you and then it's a toss of the coin whether they could ever enforce it against you in Russia. So I'm sorry for that sort of bit of cynicism there but um, you know one has to be realistic so, uh, um, uh, so that's a slightly different twist on it. Um, the other thing about the New York Convention, uh, which has been briefly touched on, is that that too can have its uh, pitfalls um, because although the enforcing state isn't supposed to look very closely at the award itself, they're just supposed to put it into effect and enforce it. Uh, that can still be an issue, I understand that has been an issue from time to time in Russia. People have looked very, you know, whether people have got the right authority to sign things as a reason to undermine uh, an arbitration award made in, say, England or somewhere else. And in many countries, uh, you have the problem uh, where uh, the get out that is used not to enforce uh, an arbitration award under the convention is public policy. So a nice little example of that was uh, the Rolling Stones. Uh, they had to cancel a number of concerts in China. I think Keith Richards had fallen out of a tree or something. And uh, basically they got a, an arbitration award in England uh, saying that uh, they were entitled to recover the upfront payments uh, that were made. Uh, on cancellation. Um, it was found as a matter of public policy in China that this decadent Western rock band, it would not be in the public interest for them to make money out of this. Uh, so that was a, uh, a, a fairly elastic uh, interpretation of public policy and a particular example where Mick Jagger failed to get satisfaction. So um, moving swiftly on, Five minutes. Oh, that's fine. Um, uh, we've covered all this ground already, uh, so I'll go straight through that. Um, I'll mention in England the most popular arbitral institutions are uh, the ICC, although that is a Paris based organisation, and that is a. Uh, I don't like the ICC. I think it is over-bureaucratic and it's front-end cost-loaded. 
So you end up with an ICC arbitration. Uh, a lot of the work has to be done initially before the parties have really decided whether they have a proper fight. Um, and there's a dirty great big fee you pay the ICC secretariat in Paris for it. So whilst the ICC does have some advantages for really big arbitrations where you're making absolutely sure it's going to be enforced somewhere because it's almost at a state to state level, uh, if you run of the mill commercial disputes, I, I try and avoid it. Uh, the LMAA, on the other hand, for marine disputes, charter party disputes, etc., and some insurance related disputes. Um, the issue fee, uh, sorry, the appointment fee for your arbitrator is £250. So if you just want to protect time, get it underway and see if you are able to come to terms with your opponents, um, that's hands down a, a, the cheapest way of doing it. Um, and so you basically, you look at what your nature of your case is and if you have the choice, because obviously a lot of these are actually written into contracts in to start with, so you may not have that much flexibility. But where you have the flexibility, just work out what kind of claim you've got, how, what would be the most cost-effective way of dealing with it, and make those decisions, as we've said, between court and arbitration. Uh, I've just covered off on ICC. I hate it, so we'll move swiftly on from that. Uh, likewise, L LMAA basically covered it. I think I, the other thing I'd say about the LMAA, uh, the body of professional arbitrators is, is getting very old and we need new blood and that is gradually coming in. Uh, but they are very uh, professional in dealing uh, with the cases. Uh, they are seldom criticised uh, at, court, at high court level for one of the reasons you can go to High Court to try and appeal it is if they've gone off the rails in relation to an important legal aspect of the case. And I think it is a tribute to the professionalism of the LMA, LMA arbitrators that they seldom get overturned on that basis. Um, they can be expensive, they, or you get quite a few uh, uh, lawyers and others uh, charging a very decent hourly rate, so that is part of the equation. Um, briefly to mention ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution, mediation, where you have got a big dispute between parties, particularly I'd say if you were in the High Court, do consider using mediation. Um, mediation typically will come in towards the end of uh, a case when the parties have exchanged all their pleadings, they've exchanged their evidence, they know where they stand. So party A is saying this and I've got this evidence, party B is saying the, the, entirely the opposite, but they can see where they stand and the, it makes sense at that stage to go and have uh, prepare papers each side saying what their best points are and actually physically get together to see before the really expensive part of litigation, which is the trial, uh, which is monumentally expensive compared to the rest of the proceedings, because you have to, all the time and people, witnesses turning up, all the rest of it. Uh, and before you get to that very expensive stage, it's usually worthwhile uh, to, to have a mediation. It doesn't always work. I had, a, I had a very, I had two separate attempts, so two entirely wasted days, where I had a case where there was, um, it was, I was acting for the London market in relation to a misappropriation claim. Um, the assured had managed to lose 140,000 tonnes of soya bean, which is an awful lot of soya bean, in what was essentially uh, a warehouse fraud in, uh, um, in Indonesia. Um, there have been a number of these um, misappropriation claims to hit the London market over the years. And uh, after two days of mediation, uh, we remained $87 million apart. Uh, so that was not a good use of, of money, but in most cases where there is some give and take between the parties, some semblance of commercial relationship left, mediation is, is a good idea. Finally, I started with why you like it should choose England as a jurisdiction. We often forget that law and jurisdiction are two things. The law of the contract is the law that's going to be applied to it. The jurisdiction is where it's going to be heard, and it's perfectly possible to split those jurisdictions. For example, in Singapore, 
that's often seen as a nice place to sort out Asian disputes, you can have an, a Singapore arbitration governed by English law, as an example. So why choose English law? Um, we have freedom of contract. What you write into that contract, the parties are stuck with. Um, and that means you, as long as you're clear in what you say, you can be reasonably confident that English law will uphold it, uh, even if that uh, may look a bit one-sided. Also, uh, damages in England um, are, on a com under English law, are on a compensatory basis. So you're, the aim of all damages is to put the wronged party back into the position they would have been had there not been a breach of contract, had there not been negligence. And that means we don't put up with silly claims for punitive damages, which is a definite advantage, which obviously is a, a feature in the United States, for example. We have a, a, this unitary legal system, which I've, I've described, where we have experience and consistency, uh, and that is a plus. Um, and because we have 300 years of precedent, which can be used as a quarry you, uh, to, to look at what individual points say, uh, we have that in our favour. And if you choose the, uh, to go for arbitration, the High Court is very supportive of the arbitral process. And that brings me to the end, and I should just like to thank you all for staying and listening. Thank you. Thank you.